Say hi. This is Maggie. We got her maybe three weeks ago. I don't know if you can hear her purring. She's purring very loud. So today I'm gonna to be doing something a little bit different, something that I've never really done before. I went ahead and was going through all of the docs on my computer and looking through some of my very, very old writing, stuff that I wrote when I was in high school. And I decided that I wanted to put it all into one doc together and look at my writing progression throughout the past 13 years. I have a lot of insecurity about sharing my writing. Like I struggle to share my writing even with my friends, with my family, with my partner. I don't share my writing. And so I decided that I wanted to make this video in part to also like help me overcome my fear of sharing my writing with the world. <laughs> I'm not really looking for critiques with this. This is just something I wanted to make to show how I've grown throughout the years. So this is my writing in excerpts from the year 2009 to present. Two thousand nine to two thousand eleven, age fourteen through seventeen. One. Out of nowhere, light bursts through the trees up ahead. The hiss of a train engine whistled, breaking the silence of the night. My heart stopped in terror. Quick, behind those trees, I yelled to my companions. I let myself fall behind my friends, steering them in the direction of safety, or so it was to be for now. The sounds of the tracks rumbling were like the growl of a hungry lion waiting for its prey to leave its safety and face the death ahead. The growling became louder until it became not a growl, but a roar. Like the hunted, we shivered in fear as the train soared past. The sun peeked over the trees. Its golden light gently touched the broken camp as though it too pitied our loss. Poppy and Lily had arrived in the camp, ash and moss nowhere in sight. My heart sank as I realized I would spend the next moon and a half alone. I reached up to touch my throbbing neck. It was as if the impression of Peter's fingers had embedded into my nerves. Peter. I glanced around looking for him, but he was nowhere to be seen. He left as soon as I convinced him not to kill you, Bird stated rather bluntly, her gaze now focused on me. Then everything returned. Amara. Sar. The sword. The vortex. The pain. Garrett. What happened on the trails? She questioned, kneeling in front of me. I turned my head from her gaze as I felt the tears start to well in my eyes. Garrett. Whatever happened, I promise you, it's not your fault. Somehow that doesn't make me feel any better. 2013 to 2014, age 18 through 20, two. The desiccated ground crunched beneath my feet. Clouds of dust spilled up behind me, every plant scorched. This realm had become a barren wasteland. Nothing appeared to be alive here. Arid skies seemed endless. Each drop of sweat sucked desperately into the ground. Six days I'd gone without water. My mouth parched like the cracked ground that stretched perpetually into the sky. My empty leather canteen flopped with each tedious step, the smack of the hollow bag my funeral march. I can't take this. Lucia tried to hand the ornate knife back to me. It was given to me by my mother years ago, and I knew Lucia could see the value it had, but I didn't want to hold on to it anymore. All it did was bring up memories of a time when I couldn't defend myself despite all the weapons I held in my hands. Yes, you can. I want you to have it. But Lucia, take it. I don't want it. Really. It's happening again. Lyriel rubbed his fingers against his temples, a faint white glow flickering around the edges of his form. The council chambers grew silent, his statement echoing across the domed structure. The crystalline walls seemed to vibrate with it, the etched glass sucking it into its intricate structures. 2015 to 2016. Age 20 to 22. Three. The trees rose in the dawn, their soft light whispering Saren from sleep. She rubbed her eyes, stretching her hands towards the sky in a heavy yawn. Vibrations flickered through her chest, the forest itself reaching out and greeting her. She smiled, fingers brushing against the knotted roots poking up from the ground. Warmth seemed to radiate from them and swirl up under her fingertips and into her very core. It was a welcome like no other, a pure understanding she could never find in the real world. A hissing crack shattered the atmosphere, gold and red blossoming against the blackened sky. The shrill scream of metal fractured against the desolate night. A whining whirl of a misfiring engine swirled by at ultrasonic speed. The wind gave around the oval body of the metallic engine, blasting out in all directions, shaking the leaves loose from the centering blast as the engine careened into the craggy steeps of a clawing mountain. 
spark of blue fire gathered into a glowing orb and exploded in the deafening ricochet of light. A woman stumbled from the wreckage. That's what he thinks I'm here to do, right? That's what everyone believes. I'm from Elbanon, so of course I must have some innate desire to kill your king. Warren let out an exasperated sigh, confirmation of his fears, of all their fears, echoing faintly in the gold flux in his irises. That doesn't mean you should joke about it. Saren's eyes met the ground, a darkness twisting her brow. Warren, if I wanted to kill your king, would I be standing here right now? Warren finally met her gaze, biting down on his lip. Saren took a breath and continued. If I wanted to kill your king, if that's what I was after tonight, do you think you could stop me? 2017 to 2019, age 22 to 25, 4. Prince Alden, fire-eyed, lion-hearted, king incumbent of Drith. The words echoed against Alden's eardrums. He twisted the gaudy ruby ring on his finger, the king's sigil. Its metallic surface itched a fire into his knuckle and seemed to whisper, you don't belong here. For as long as Saren had known her father, he'd never spoken a word. He was the sound of a latching door, a staggering step, and a harsh and shallow cough. He was the shape of a curved and hunched back retreating into the dark, a muffled whisper in the night that Saren begged to understand, but in his presence, she was met with only the irrepressible feeling of death. He ate with slow and labored breaths. His black, glassy eyes stared at nothing. And though she sat before him, it was as if Saren and her brother didn't exist. As if the whole world were a mere shadow of a thing, the only reality existing somewhere locked inside his mind. A hollowness settled over Saren's chest as she scooped a spoonful of porridge into her mouth and lazily slurped the slop. A part of her felt that once she had heard his voice, that once a person had existed in his space, but all that remained in her memories now was the shell that sat before her. Saren swallowed. Father, eat your porridge, Nana Dio muttered. Her icy gaze cut across the table in Saren's side, her lips drawing into a tight line. She pushed the slop across the bowl before finally scooping another spoonful. Alden sighed and pinched the bridge of his nose. The weight of the orders in the palm of his hand carried the bulk of a leaden ball tearing through the hull of a ship, though its shape was contained in that of a simple scroll, light as a feather. The ink scrawled along the paper in lazy decorative strokes. Pages and pages of curled reports and recommendations covered every square inch of Alden's desk, each as ordinary as the last. And yet this one, crinkled in his hands, was the only to adorn the blackened seal of the royal household. Alden tensed his fingers itching to crumple the parchment and toss it into the glowing hearth in the corner of the room. Secede from all patrols to outerlying townships. Contain themselves within the battlements for the safety of the Commonwealth by order of the High Council of Drith, undersigned the king. Without even so much as a word, the king stripped away Alden and his squadron's right to move as they pleased. Contained within the battlements, Alden scoffed, his lips curling as his fingers tightened over the scroll. Had Alden no restraint, he'd have marched right over to the king's chambers and demanded an explanation. But Alden knew the answer he'd received. And as persuasive as Alden could be, history could not be rewritten. Not this time. Twenty twenty, ages twenty-five to twenty-six, five. Tarek. Tart glanced up from the volume spread across his lap. June stood at the base of the stairs, his fingers clenched tight over the railing. A faint sheen of sweat clung to his forehead, and he'd taken on a sickly pallor that not even the faint candlelight could hide. Tark sat up. You okay? He wasn't even sure why he asked when the answer was plainly written before him, perhaps if only to offer June an opportunity to contradict. But instead of responding, June chewed and chewed at his lip, his gaze falling to the floorboards. Tark waited, thumbing absentmindedly at the pages of the book in his hands, but the silence only grew too indefinite. Did you need some water? He tried. June looked up, his brow beginning to scrunch in protest as Tark folded down a corner of his page and closed the book in his lap. Sit, he said, rising to his feet. Tark, sit. Tark didn't even look over his shoulder as he turned and made his way across the room. You've been gone six years, Tark. Thick sorrow hung heavy in her voice and Tark froze solid to the spot as she continued. You were my best friend. I don't understand what happened to people change, Sadie. Tark cut in and silence sliced the air between them. He clasped his hands together, fingernails digging harshly into the flesh of his knuckles. Whoever it is you're looking for is long dead and gone. Are you okay? June asked, gaze heavy and searching, and Tark's lips pressed together. Am I okay? Honestly, Tark wasn't sure. A foggy veil of numbness had wrapped over his mind, and a deep-seated fear had taken up residence in his gut. He wasn't even sure where the anxiety came from. Only a few flashes of cut-off sounds and blurry images remained, as if the entire moment had been haphazardly erased from Tark's memory. All of it. The fog, the sorrow, the fear, culminated into the vacant feeling of death. I don't know. 
The words fell from Tarek's mouth in a whisper. I... I don't know. 2021. Age 26 to 27. 6. Adrenaline fired in a flash of white and a sudden heaviness settled over a space in the back right corner of Saren's mind. A ghostly, unseen shape floated to the surface. It studied Saren with an unnerving degree of intelligence and then all at once a soft voice lifted from that faraway place and whispered, And what of you? Are you scared too? Seconds turned to minutes, time transforming into an infinite loop, the past, present, and future coalescing into a distorted suggestion of reality. Paige drew in a shaking breath. How could one be in attendance to both the past and the present? To watch as here and now suddenly receded beneath the weight of a lost memory? It was in these moments that Paige became convinced that time did not exist outside a constant grating state of cacophony. Even at this very second, visions of now warped under the pressure of half-forgotten moments and gnarled beneath the grind of anxiety's anxiety. The future left to spiral, fading from existence with every fleeting second. Paige shrugged, lips pulling tight. I'm not as alright as I'd like to be. Lake let out a long breath and took a seat at her side again, hands folding in their lap. Talk, they murmured, turning to face her. Baba, she groaned, and a smile touched Lake's mouth. Paige, they chided back in Paige's side. Lake took her hand in theirs, squeezing softly, and Paige found herself staring at the far wall. I don't know, Paige mumbled. Just thinking about what had happened today had emotions she didn't want to feel rising in her gut. The overwhelming weight of weakness twisted into thoughts of inadequacy and echoed in the bite of fear, of pain hiding just beneath it all. Lake's grip on her tightened as a soft, false laugh pulled at Paige's chest. She felt ridiculous, anxious even, and yet somehow the words Lake was after lifted past her lips in a hollowed-out rasp. I... I feel useless. Like I don't really know how to be me anymore. Tark bolted upright in the cot as the fabric of time washed back over his senses. A blur of colors, a flicker of memory, flew through his mind at an impossible pace. A fight, a flash of startlingly white light. Tark couldn't think, could barely breathe, his fingers curling and twisting into the fabric of his shirt. Lexima, he murmured, name leaving his lips in an incomprehensible jumble. His tongue felt like lead, his throat drier than the desiccated lands of Daria. Tark's gaze shot across the room. Where the fuck am I? Where's Lex? Sadie. Tark didn't remember leaving the temple, didn't remember coming across whatever shack it was he now slept in, and then Tark froze solid. There were people in the room, one middle-aged and balding, the other with long, dark brown hair pulled back into a misshapen bun. They stood together, staring at Tark with wide eyes. 2022, age 27. 7. Bryn's Grove was steeped in the scourge of magic. Flickers of a virulent glow whispered through the boughs, pale light cracking the barks of towering oaks black and enshrouding the woodland in a veil of milky fog. To breathe the grove's sodden air was to chance a venture into the place between, and yet somehow Saren found herself wandering towards that patch of blackened oaks, listening for murmurs of a time long since past. Paige drew in a shallow breath. That ever-present heartbreak echoed against her lungs. Not too long ago, that ache, that feeling, had shattered her spirit into a thousand pieces and scattered it along the breeze. Isolation swept in just behind it, taking the name and place of friend, and painted the world in shades of muddy gray. The wall. Home. Even just the idea of it sprung forth a vibrant hope so deeply felt it caught the breath from Paige's lungs and grew into the shape of sanguine conviction. Home. Paige let out that long-held breath, eyes falling shut. We're going home. Thunder rattled the earth beneath Tark's feet, and a soft smile pulled at the corner of his mouth. Perhaps this storm would be the one to finally wash his soul clean of all his vices and steal away the guilt that pierced his gut raw. After the storm, and only after, would the will of necrosis finally wash ashore and set his spirit free. Inside, Tark jolted as Lexima grasped hold of his elbow. Shrieks of pale rose pigment bled down her cheeks, the downpour loosening the rouge she'd painted there hours before. She pushed her sopping black hair out of her eyes, her deep brown gaze practically burning a hole through Tark's skull. Now, she growled, her grip tightening. Tark nodded, fumbling over his feet as she dragged him towards the temple. I apologize if you can hear a purring cat. I mean, I don't really apologize because like, who doesn't love a purring cat? She's very loud. I don't know if you're gonna be able to hear her. So that is my writing from 2009 to now. I'll go ahead and overlay 
on the screen my 2009 writing right side by side with my 2022 writing, partly because I want to see it, because um, I'm curious what that looks like. It's wild to see how far I've come in the past 13 years. It's also wild to say it's been 13 years. I feel old. That first excerpt that I read is my oldest piece of writing. I wrote it in 2009. I wrote it for a class. That piece, we had a student teacher. Her name was Miss Robespierre. Um, she was wonderful. We all loved her. And she was the person who graded that piece. And I remember getting it back and she had written this really big note on the back of it, just like encouraging me and telling me all the things that she saw in my writing that she thought were great and encouraging me to go on to take creative writing classes. That was one of the first times in my life that I ever received feedback like that from an adult in my life. And it alongside of NaNoWriMo is one of the reasons that I feel that I've been able to make as much progress as I feel that I've made. I've gotten a lot better at commas, a lot better at grammar. Um, I feel like I've gotten better at describing things in a way that makes sense rather than just like throwing words together that I think sound pretty together. I think I've gotten a lot better at showing versus telling. I think it's fascinating to see the growth and also really interesting to see like some of the same voice and language usage that I have continued in phrasing that's just remained within my writing as well, even from back in 2009. I feel like I can still see little pieces of that writer in the stuff that I presently write, which is really cool to see. And I think that little 14 year old me would be proud of me and where I've come. I'm really hoping that I'm gonna be able to finish this and share it. And if that's my goal, I need to start working towards that goal and practice getting more comfortable with letting other people read my writing. If you like this video, feel free to give it a like. If you disliked it, smash the dislike button. Um, if you wanna subscribe, feel free to do so. You're always welcome to hang out here and be on this corner of the internet with me. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.